Okay. Right now. All right. So, um, yeah, welcome to ESMACONF 2023 and the panel discussion on considerations around information retrieval, including text analysis. This session is being live streamed to YouTube and automatic subtitles should be available shortly after this event and we'll work hard to get these manually verified as soon as possible. If you have any questions for our presenters, you can ask them via the hashtag ES Hackathon Twitter account by commenting on the tweet about this session. If you registered for the conference, you can also comment and chat with other participants on our dedicated Slack channel. We will endeavor to answer all questions as soon as possible. And we would also like to take time to draw your attention to our code of conduct available on the ESMAConf website at www.esmaconf.org. And yeah, so today we want to discuss um, well, the future and uh, the presence of, present of information retrieval and have a look at tools that might be useful in uh, information retrieval for an in evidence synthesis. And information retrieval in the context of evidence synthesis covers all considerations and tasks after the research question has been defined. And I'd say before synthesizing the identified evidence. And this so may include the quick and dirty initial searches for refining a research question. And thus, for example, specifying a schema like PICO more precisely. But usually the main focus, I would say, are the systematic and reproducible searches, which are the basis for a comprehensive evidence synthesis. So um, yeah, furthermore, there's maybe the choice of sources, approaches, and platforms for searching, which are important tasks during the information retrieval phase of evidence synthesis. And this includes, of course, creating a search strategy for each designated search uh, source. And all of these topics, we want to exchange ideas on and exchange our knowledge about this essential step in evidence synthesis today. And maybe think about what has changed in the last few years and what tools exist for information retrieval nowadays and maybe should exist for in the future. And so with great pleasure, I will now introduce our panelists. Um, which have so kindly followed our invitation to join the discussion today for the next hour. And today I'm joined by Alison Beithel, um, Michael Gusenbauer, Hannah O'Keefe, and Guido Zukon. And um, yeah, Alison Beithel is from the evidence synthesis team and at the University of Exeter. And Alison, would you um, like to say some words about your current work? Hi, thanks, Claudia, and uh, thanks for the invitation uh, to join the panel. Um, yeah, I've been working for the evidence synthesis team for 12 years now. Um, so as part of the evidence synthesis team, we do systematic reviews, evidence and gap maps, rapid reviews, whole suite realist reviews. Um, and I've probably been an author on 50 plus systematic reviews um, in my 12 years, um, and obviously been involved and sort of given advice perhaps on quite a few others so I spend my days doing a lot of searching on databases and pulling my hair out on a lot of the databases as well so hi thanks great uh, it's great to have you on board and all your experience for today's discussion so uh our next panelist is Michael Gusenbauer he's from the Johannes Kepler University at Linz and yeah we're very curious to hear a little bit about your work, Michael. Yeah, thanks for the invitation. Um, yeah, I, I got uh, interested in evidence synthesis or in, in my field, uh, innovation management. Uh, we are not only interested in evidence, but uh, also broadly in, in, in all types of literature. And I um, got interested in, during my PhD, I was, doing a review on a tricky topic of offshoring, which has different, different meanings and so on. And, and I got interested uh, in where to actually search and I didn't find the answers in my field and I got more and more curious. And that led me to um, just last week, I launched a new website, which is called searchsmart.org, where I make um, the databases comparable with which uh, we uh, we search or not search or we, which we should know um, 
So maybe we can discuss it later on that um, I found that a lot of new search innovations are hardly ever used or only within niches that uh, do not make uh, uh, or do not reach a broader audience. And I, I tried to do that also with the new websites. So thank you for the invitation. Thank you for joining us. And this sounds definitely like something to discuss in a few minutes. So before we go there, um, I'd love to give the word to Hannah O'Keefe. She's from the Innovation Observatory at Newcastle University. And Hannah, tell us about your work. Hi, thank you, Claudia. Thank you very much for the invitation to be here today. Um, so I'm an information specialist, but I also work within our data science team looking at development of new tools and looking at how we use the existing tools that are already out there. I have a big interest in how we go from this very technical side of development and all those stages right through to the user experience and how we make these tools accessible for a very wide audience, some of which have some good experience with technologies and some of which have never used any of these sorts of tools before. So that's where my interests lie. Thank you. Thank you, Hannah. Um, yeah, so our um, last but not least panelist is Guido Zucon. He is uh, from the School of Electrical Engineering and Computer Science at the University of Queensland. So thank you so much for joining us. I know it's late for you already. Um, Guido, tell us what you do in Queensland. Hi, everyone. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so I am an AI, artificial intelligence researcher, um, and my main topic of investigation is uh, uh, search engines, creating methods to, to improve how search engines work, and also how we uh, as, as uh, uh, searchers can formulate very effective queries. Um, so a lot of the work we do is applied in, uh, in the evidence synthesis area. Um, we have been working on uh, how we can improve the creation of Boolean queries and uh, making these Boolean queries more effective. And we have been working on uh, how we can uh, achieve good uh, screen prioritization or how can we uh, automate the screening process and even how we can evaluate uh, um, uh, systematically the impact these different AI tools have on the uh, on the. Uh, compilation, the systematic review, the synthesis of the evidence, and, and the final outcome of the review. Thank you again for having me here. You're muted, Claudia. Thank you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I am your moderator today. My name is Claudia Kapp. I work at ICWIC, which is the German Health Technology Assessment Agency, and I work as an information specialist there. So I'm on the uh, one hand also responsible for conducting the searches, the searches, but on the other hand, I also lead our internal project to automate our information retrieval workflows. So we are, for example, currently developing our own Shiny app and um, yeah. So I'm also more and more getting uh, insights on the development side of things and not just the user part, which is very interesting indeed. Um, but first, uh, my first question I would like to pose to you is actually more uh, from the user perspective before we maybe go into how, you know, what tools we need to develop. And I, I'm quite new to this field of information retrieval. I recently, I used to work on psychological research before. So Alison, I would be really curious to hear what has changed, what practices have evolved in information retrieval since you first started. Thanks, how far back we go here. <laughs> My first job uh, 30 years ago was actually an information retrieval, but I don't think we want to go back that far. So in terms of when I started at extra medical school, um, so that's 12 years ago, I don't, I actually don't think practices have changed an awful lot. You know, there are, you know, the databases we use haven't changed that much, unfortunately. Um, there are some, you know, tools available online that help us, but I think fundamentally what we do hasn't really changed. Um, the information we have to wade through to get the relevant stuff um there's even more of it so you know there's, there's that kind of thing but 
Um, but in the actual practice of searching, I don't think a lot's changed. I, I think some things have changed in uh, the acceptance of it, perhaps. You know, so there's um, you you now have to report a lot more on the search, and that's more acceptable. You know, but when we started, we still collected all that. It just wasn't published. Uh, the Cochrane reviews have always done that, so all the searches are on there. So that's taken a while to kind of filter through to the to the rest of the kind of systematic reviews. Um, other things that have changed, uh, the types of reviews, you know, the different types of evidence synthesis, you know, so from kind of realist reviews, uh, rapid reviews. So that does involve different ways of searching, but you're still essentially using the same tools. You know, we're still using, you know, the same platforms to access, you know, databases. Um, yeah, so I'd like to say it changed more than it has, you know, because, you know, 10 years ago, we published a paper on the first thing I thought was how the, the interfaces, we thought the interfaces were really difficult to use. And we wrote a paper on that. And, you know, these, you know, just searching this morning, you know, they still haven't got much better unfortunately I'm not going to name names <laughs> <laughs> all right well that's very well known. <laughs> so what you're saying is that maybe the approach hasn't changed that much actually but on the other hand maybe the the needs have changed you know? yeah we definitely yeah no that's 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 good yeah so we it would be good if things would change but the pace of change is so slow and the, the question was about practice so we still develop a search and run a search and then screen the results. You know, you might have a screening tool that helps you, um, you know, filter the, this, you know, the, the ones come to the top that are more, you know, that are going to be, you know, the, the ones that are going to be included. But actually, you know, it's, you know, as a searcher, you're still having to do that initial groundwork. And there might be tools that say, okay, these search terms or these mesh terms or whatever are going to be helpful, but actually you still have to put the search together um, you know, it's not just A plus B plus C, there you go. You know, there's quite a lot of um, development and art goes into creating the search strategy. And I, and I don't think that has changed that much. And I think, Hannah, you just recently published a paper where you actually had a look at all of those tools that actually try and help, you know, with uh, analyzing which terms to Uh, conduct a search with maybe um, you want to share some thoughts on what Alison just said yeah so I actually I agree with Alison on this one that we can use these tools and they they do help to a certain extent um, but there is still a lot of manual input that's needed we still need to compile those searches even if we look through and we find the most frequently used terms or terms that are very important, but they're not used very often within some sample texts, we still need to try and identify which ones of those are going to give us the best results when we're searching. Because we've got to get this balance of precision, sensitivity versus specificity. And it's trying to find that. And the only way to do that at the moment currently is this manual input. So I think there is a need for change in the way that we do things, but I do agree it's slow. And to be able to replace a lot of the human input is going to take us a long time to get the tools to the right level so that we can use them accurately. So um, Guido, I think that your team has done some work on trying to actually automate exactly this process. So what are your insights on, you know, this endeavor, trying to reduce the manual input? Uh, yes. So the, the work we have done has been, uh, you know, start from uh, uh, your research questions so or the topic of your review and uh, attempt to automatically uh, formulate a Boolean query or start from an initial Boolean query and improve the Boolean query to be comprehensive, uh, or even start from a seed of uh, studies that you might have for development of the, of the search strategy and automatically build the search strategy. Um, 
what we found is that there is uh, there's uh, um, there's quite a lot of promise in these automatic methods, and as the the technology becomes more powerful, you know, with the latest with these large generative language models, for example. Um, we see that the effectiveness of these methods are going up, but you know we are still in need for for information specialists to uh, you know carefully uh, edit these queries and uh, and really um, carefully review, especially in terms of possible biases the queries can have uh, or or possible um, um, let's say concept drifts these queries might create. Uh, we certainly have noticed that. AI is quite effective in uh, um, reducing the noise that you get from your queries. Um, not as much, though, in terms of uh, um, improving uh, the recall or, or better. There is always that trade-off between precision recall. Um, one of the, the biggest challenges we have had, and I would like to hear from, from Hannah because he can, she kind of touched upon these in, in, in her answer. The, the biggest challenge that we had is that we are able to do evaluation from a retrospective um, perspective. You know, we, we, we know a review has been done. We, we attempt to build the query automatically. We know that there will be some unjudged uh, documents that we retrieve and that were not retrieved originally. We try to deal with that. But what we find difficult is, is when we present our query, um, you know, that we automatically build to get the information specialist to try to gauge if that is a good query or a bad query, right? You say that, uh, and, uh, and I think also Alison mentioned, is a bit of, a, of an art to formulate these queries from a human perspective, right? And I wonder how do you go about judging whether the query you have formed is a good query? Right, and so that, that that's one line of research we are interested in pursuing, and 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 we are looking into whether we can come up with metrics that can help uh, the information specialist in trying to judge the quality of their query beyond looking at the convenient sample of seed studies and say, do I retrieve my seed studies, for example? So I don't know, Alison uh, and uh, and Hannah, back to you, I guess. So I think this is really difficult. Um, a lot of us will use our sort of sample set of studies and make sure they have been retrieved. Um, we may have a look at a little bit of backwards and forwards citation chaining to see if there's those sorts of papers are also being received. Um, in terms of metrics, I'm I'm not really sure what would be most beneficial. I don't know if. Alison's got any input to that. I think a lot of it comes from general experience. Yeah, unfortunately, Anne, I think you're right. It is experience. And, you know, if we can get that experience further, you know, you know, the beginning of when you start, be, you know, doing this sort of stuff, the better. Um but I, I yeah, I, I yeah, I agree with Hannah. One thing, some of the things I do now is I might um I might run the search that I've developed in Medline and then give it uh, to the reviewers to screen. And once they've screened Medline, then I might develop the searches in the other databases, you know, because I'm, I know that most of my results are going to come out of Medline. So there are things like that, sending sample search, you know, search results that like you've already said um, and just looking through them. But I think Often it might come down to, it's going to sound really bad, often it will come down to the number of hits, you know. So if you're getting 10,500 from one database and you know the systematic review has nine months and there are three or two people working part-time, you, you know they can't get through that sort of screening. Um, so you have to be pragmatic and say, okay, you know, I, I can't, I need to get this, <laughs> I need to get this smaller. And I know like Hannah, and Guido said, you know, you use um, like a, you know, a, a list of key papers, a sentinel papers, whatever you want to call them. But um, I, I get a bit worried about that because I, I try not to develop my search around them. And I don't mind if I miss a few um, from my search, say, in one database, because I think 
well, if I develop the search just to find those papers, I've already got them. So, you know, um, I'm just going to like the bias might be introduced there. So it is, it is just, yeah. And if we can make that um, easier, um, that would, it, it, I think it would help information specialists because you would, because otherwise it is just up to the individual or if it's been peer reviewed, you know, maybe to go, okay, that, that's what I'm doing. But you always have that kind of, mm, is it going to be okay? <laughs> no. yeah. I think one thing on that is you could develop a search strategy and you think it might be all right, but you could pass it to another 20 information specialists and they would always have something to add or something to change. And I don't think even between us that we could all come up with the perfect search strategy. So it's finding a balance, definitely. Yeah, we used to run um, a course for information specialists and we'd get them to do a task where we gave them a research question um, and before they came to the course, they had to develop a search in PubMed and then we would collate it all together and see the number of hits and whether they got the included articles. And, and yeah, the huge range, you know, we, we said don't spend more than 30 minutes. So it was quite time restricted, but like you said, Hannah, all different. <laughs> Um, maybe I add something to that. Um, maybe you're talking about information specialists and, and uh, you, you're the experts there and, and maybe the, the goal of AI and, and those new tools is not to improve the information specialists quality, but rather to, I come from a field management where the standard, I would say, we, we just uh, worked on a review of, of um, literature review practices and management and we found um, that the practices are not really up to standards of medicine and, and there's a lot of people um, now publishing reviews, meta-analysis and, and those sorts of things and the, the quality is um, not always uh, yeah, you, you, you wouldn't like it uh, as an information specialist and I think to get those studies up to speed and, and get uh, give them a good start, maybe um, at the low end, at, at the lower quality, to, to improve the lower quality studies to an acceptable level where um, uh, a lot of um, weak weaknesses can be uh, addressed is might be already uh, something really valuable of, of the AI systems. Hmm. So that was definitely. Practically, you're suggesting that uh, AI uh, could uh, serve almost as a um, standardization or, or it might level the field uh, uh, a bit uh, in terms of, uh, of raising the quality of uh, most of the reviews. Um, and, then, and then we have the, the maybe very, very uh, specialistic and high quality review that go beyond what the AI can do as a baseline, let's say. Uh, and that's a very good point. Uh, and related to what you say, I noticed uh, um, for, for the work we have we have done, we needed to access to uh, data, systematic review data. We had, the, we had to, to mine queries and we found it to be very difficult to extract uh, search queries from published systematic reviews. Um, you know, we had to come up with very, um, very, a very laborious process of data cleaning to extract these, uh, uh, you know, we automated as much as possible, but still there were errors there. And what was interesting to us was that even queries that were reported in, uh, in high quality publications, like within the Cochrane uh, reviews, even those queries contained errors, you know, obvious errors, whether the query contained typos or the query even could compile in, uh, in, uh, when you search PubMed. Um, and, and so I think that an important step uh, in, in the field would be to, to uh, improve and standardize how all the metadata related to the search is, is reported and is shared with the community. Uh, and more and more we, we move towards the attempt to using AI, this metadata having clean, um, high quality metadata is very important uh, for, for powering these AI algorithms. Mm. Yeah, that's a great point. And um, especially with your experience trying to extract <laughs> these mm -hmm. information, I think there's an effort at the moment to actually create some kind of search archive for search strategies and to try and find 
um, a standardized um, template, right? For um, into yeah, for to be included for search strategies, which I think is a very interesting approach. And then again, I think information retrieval is not only the search strategy, right? There's also more expertise around it. And I think one field also is the question of where to search actually. So what, what source, sources should we use and should we apply? And um, I think Micha, you may mention that you've done a lot there. And I think also, you know, trying to standardize search strategies, for example, one of the biggest challenges is that each database has a different uh, approach on how to find their data actually, right? Um, yes, uh, so I, I tried to, and I, I published a few papers on that, on, on, on the methods of identifying or, or defining common denominators across the various um, databases, search engines, um, and so on. Um, and um, yeah, it was quite difficult to, to, to identify that common denominator. And, but what, um, I, I don't want to go into too much detail about how, uh, how that worked, but uh, what I found out is um, there's a lot, and, and that's uh, what I mentioned at the beginning, that we have a lot of innovation actually happening within the last years in new databases like lens.org, dimensions.ai, um and others um that the, where the problem is what i see and, and i did a, a, a working paper out there where i comp uh, compared the usage of those uh, systems and uh, it's still the same systems that are used uh, that were used 10 20 uh, not, not 20 but 10 15 years ago um it's google scholar pubmed and, and science direct which are the top three i i couldn't collect data on, on, on ProQuest and, and uh, the, the payload systems. Um, but it's, I think, interesting because there are so many um, systems that say, well, I'm the Google Scholar killer and, and uh, we can do it so much better. But still, um, those systems, they, they cannot uh, get out of the niche. And, and I, don't, I don't have the answer entirely. What's, what's the problem there? If it's Google Scholar is just so good or... Um, if, if people just uh, use the same ways of, of searching uh, over time. So, um, and I think uh, maybe AI uh, might be a game changer now because um, um, most people like to search uh, privately, or like, like um, what they use privately, they mostly also use in, in, in their research work. And uh, maybe evidence synthesis is, is like a, um, very elaborate use of searching. Uh, we have a lot higher standards, uh, comprehensiveness, reproducibility, transparency. And that is not uh, the case when you just search or look up uh, an article. Um, but most of the most of the researchers stay with the same systems and they like the, the systems um, for all uses. And, and that's how we still discuss now in 2023 why Google Scholar is not the perfect uh, system uh, or, and, and should not should never be used as the only system in, in a systematic review and still people do it because they, they like, they like the, the, the tools they already know. And I think um, now with, with the, the new approaches as we might change our general searches. So uh, privately, I, I was on vacation. Um, I... Um, Yes, as a researcher, you're sometimes also <laughs> tricky. And I, I tried out Sydney, so the, the Microsoft uh, AI system, and, and I, I was actually very positively surprised. And people will use that too in, in, in ways uh, in, in research. And I think what, what we have to do now is um, to define use cases or tasks where this is okay and tasks where this is a problem. Um, and uh, as we have, uh, we talk now about evidence synthesis, we need to match those requirements to the capabilities of the new systems uh, that will be used. Now we are still ahead. So the usage has not changed yet too, too much, even though um, the, the chat GPT has, has 
it's, has increased tremendously in, in usage. Uh, it did not really affect yet Google Scholar or, or Google usage, um, but that will change, I would, I would say, um, uh, over the next months, years. And I think we still need to be ahead of the curve and, and look, um, okay, what are our requirements and, and develop guidance based on the new capabilities that are out there. And um, testing the systems like uh, the, the website um, um, I, I launched uh, last week, searchsmart.org, um, can be one approach. So uh, how can we test the new uh, types of systems that are out there? And uh, so, so to make them fit, fit for purpose, uh, and the, the purposes we have, yeah. I think that's very critical. Yes, definitely. And before we uh, go over discussing maybe how the search might change, I think uh, I would come back to one point you mentioned, which is that mainly, um, yeah, researchers and, and people in science are using Google Scholar, PubMed and ScienceDirect and, you know, all these other new Uh, platforms like lens.org and dimensions are you know used by a niche so i would like to hear from the other uh speakers what you think about that do you agree or is that your experience as well so for me when i'm searching i tend to stick to the more traditional databases um i know people who are using these sorts of platforms and google scholar and things and i think one point that you raised was the issue of paywalls. So you tend to find that that means the sources that are being searched varies tremendously across different institutions. And it also poses a front when it comes to us actually automating things and using tools. There's the equity in the access to the different tools, especially those that charge to use them. Um, and a lot of this really boils down to the funding that's available to maintain the tools over time and update them. And especially when we're coming back to using these new sources and trying to incorporate things like Google Scholar into the, how the tools work. So it really is this, this circle that feeds into each other. I don't know how anybody else feels about that. Yeah, I've, um, I have used uh, Dimensions on Google Scholar. I often use Google Scholar in my searching but um, for systematic reviews. But at the end of my systematic review, I do a search summary table and I can see where the evidence has come from and across all the different databases, you know, that it was in five out of the seven I searched in. And Google Scholar has never given, given me in maybe 15 of these tables, a unique reference. It's always been picked up elsewhere. So my, uh, you know, as a searcher, I sort of think, mm, okay, it's it's not it's not giving me any more than I get from the paid um, databases that I've got access to. Um, but you're right, Hannah, you know, it is all about equity. You know, it's fantastic that it's things like those are out there, but um, we're in quite a, privileged position in that we can search um, other databases and search them perhaps in a more uh, comprehensive way as well. Um, my experience has been uh, uh, observing people in the, um, in the health uh, slash medical area doing uh, these reviews. Um, and there, uh, I would say all of those that I've seen, they would use uh, um, um, Obi, the Medline, and so on, and they, they would author Boolean queries. Um, and so you have an exact match that you can explain and justify. Um, technologies such as Google Scholar, instead, they they um, they do not uh, allow you to enter Boolean queries, or or when, they, when if you do it through the advanced search functionality, it's a it's a quite a loose. Uh, um, Boolean language that they use. And uh, also the ranking is, is a very strong features in Google Scholar that, that is not really in, uh, in things like PubMed. Uh, so I think that there is a difference um, when information specialists use, you know, the more, let's say, formal uh, tooling around, around uh, uh, formulating Boolean queries and when instead they use uh, 
technology that they understand maybe a bit less or they feel less in control of, like, like Google Scholar. Um, and uh, um, I think there are benefits in, in both sides, right? And we have been trying to argue with, with uh, information friends, information specialists about the, the importance to go beyond Boolean queries and the importance to go uh, to, to look at ranking, ranking functionalities. Um, but at the end of the day, it boils down to, to what users are, are you know, familiar with and are confident with. And, and I think a, a big limitation we have, uh, you know, we as, as AI scientists at the moment, is making sure that the, the AI, the tools that are based on AI can be, can have some form of explainability. So the problem for information specialists, in my opinion, uh, around using Google Scholar um, as a replacement to PubMed, for example, is the ability of explaining that that query did retrieve everything they wanted and, and, uh, and they didn't miss anything, right? Which they can achieve with a Boolean query, but they are unsure about with, uh, with uh, uh, a semantic search engine like Scholar. And one other thing I'd like to say, about that is, you know, things like Lens or Google Scholar, they're, they're so massive. Whereas, you know, PubMed, you know, you're just looking at kind of medical research. So you think, okay, at least, you know, I'm, I've put some boundaries up there for what I'm looking for. But then when you go into something that's so massive, you, yeah, it's, it's hard to know, like you said, am I actually retrieving everything I need because of it, it's so massive. Well, the reality, though, on, on the other side is also what you said before, right? That sometimes uh, you cannot just go over everything you have retrieved, but you know you have a budget and you somewhat need to stick to that budget, right? So you are controlling that uh, through your Boolean query. There are other ways of controlling that, you know, um, for example, ranking, um, for example, not having one gigantic Boolean query, but having... Uh, uh, you know, a, a set a number of queries or query variation, issue these independently, and then somewhat merging the results and prioritizing the results. So there are alternative ways which might, might actually lead to, to some benefits, right? The issue, in my opinion, the big showstopper is, uh, is having a, a methodology that is intuitive and can be explained and, and that you can benchmark and put boundaries of confidence in, in its effectiveness, right? Um, you can do that with, with your Boolean query. Right? It's, it becomes harder with, uh, with these more uh, um, best match methods or, or, or with ranking. Yeah, so this is actually an interesting thought, I think. So the how these new technologies and you, you mentioned ranking and you know also the the ranking and PubMed you know for, is really interesting I mean you're still able to um, extract all your search results but you can also have a look at you know the best matched ranking and uh, what I was wondering is whether you know the, the part for the information retrieval and actually the um, selecting the, the 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 relevant evidence will become more and more unified or more merge more and more into one you know that you're like Alison you mentioned you first search in Medline and then you do another search for the other databases which is also sort of more embracing the idea of joining the information retrieval part where you just get everything that might be relevant and then you know screen and rank what actually is relevant more into one step. Do you, what, what, what are your thoughts on this? I'm not sure you can, because you'd have to do, you'd have to have the full text there to be able to do that. That's quite a, that's quite a big leap, I think, from, um, from screening through, it's a, a very, you know, at your bibliographic level to, yes, that's in, you know, that's that's exactly what I want at full text. Um, but I'm sure others will have a, a much better opinion of that than, than me. <laughs> yeah, in my opinion, that's a, a promising area. Um, 
in the sense that uh, at least from an AI perspective, because uh, um, you know when you search, uh, uh, we we have uh, um, data about the collection. We might have data about uh, um, you know how important uh, the terms you have put are, or how important terms we suggest uh, might be, how discriminative they are. But what we are what what most uh, um, techniques, technology tools don't do at the moment is exploiting that online signal that you are providing every time you do uh, the screening, right? Um, so, so you you have uh, um, techniques at the moment uh, uh, for screening where you are providing feedback. You know, you say this document is included, this document is excluded, and that attempts to uh, automate. Uh, the inclusion exclusion uh, assessment of the remaining documents uh, but we don't but that feedback doesn't feed back uh, to your uh, search right it doesn't say oh these do these document these reference you mark it as relevant now that i know that does that imply something to the query you know would the query change somewhat to because you know now I learned more, so we don't do that at the moment. Uh, you do it. Uh, you as an information specialist somewhat do it across database, right? You are one of the few I'm aware that does that, um, and uh, which is great, by the way. Um, but yeah, I think there is much more we can do with that type of signal. And I just say I'd love to see that because <laughs> uh, that is something I've mentioned a few times. Is that that loop back, you know, you can use machine learning, but unless it comes back into the search, we're actually not learning anything about how we're searching the database. So I would love to see something like that. It's my wish list. Um, but, but shouldn't uh, um, scoping um, fulfill that task? So you should first uh, scope uh, your query anyway. So it, it, it feeds back into the loop, the, the search results you would screen do first screening and uh look into the the language that is used within the studies and those uh, this language uh, then again is included in the keyword search um and I, I think in that step in the scoping step there's the great um advantage or the great um opportunity of of the new ai based search tools because they can be an addition to the, the traditional uh, like experts um, inquiry and, and, and um, so just screening through uh, existing reviews and, uh, and other things. Uh, we could have AI as an assistance if, of getting up, us up to speed. But then again, as you say, Alison, we have that step of a human uh, information specialist uh, looking at the uh, query that uh, comes out and then um, feeding in into the actual search and um, making sure that um, the, the query and the, the information retrieval is actually up to standard of, of systematic reviews. And maybe um, we could even have uh, the AI tools as an addition to um, like we have keyword match, we have um, citation searching, so snowballing uh, methods. Maybe we can have even um, AI search on top of like, I don't know, I'm, I'm not the expert here, but um, having a corpus of already uh, positively identified uh, studies and then do an additional uh, round of, of AI retrieval based on uh, the vectors um, and not uh based on, on, on keyword match and um as far as i understood uh, the, the cochrane handbook for example um mentions even uh, google being adequate uh, as a supplementary system so i think we, we need to uh, separate two things so first we have the the, the principal databases we search with and the the the, the the methodology that is rigorous, transparent, um, reproducible, and so on. But then um, we could even do more, even though it's not fully transparent, reproducible, as you say, uh, Guido. Um, and we could even benefit from that. Um, like you, uh, Alison says, uh, you don't find any unique hits from Google Scholar anymore, but may maybe we can even get some more hits if we um, 
search Google Scholar in addition, even though it's not perfectly suitable or use Google or those new tools um, in addition, like uh, Elicit and, and uh, the other AI tools that now pop up. Um, yeah. Perhaps we need to set your search in a different way instead of, um, you know, you've got your database searches and the, the, the terms, the keywords, the controlled vocab, whatever you're using in that. Um, but you can't use that maybe in Google Scholar and you, you just search in a completely different way. I think um, that would be that would be really good. And if you were able to, um, one thing I'd love to be able to do is to evaluate the search at the end. You know, once everything's completed, you know, um, we already do a kind of evaluation of the, the search methods. So database searching, supplementary search methods, we see where it all comes from. But then we're now starting to evaluate the search at the very end as well to see, okay, this search in this database was these number of lines long, but actually this one term in the title picked up all the relevant stuff, you know. So if we could, you know, do that at the end and then that would make that would help make our searching evidence-based rather than experience-based like we were talking about earlier, that a lot of it comes from your experience of doing this stuff. But if we could, you know, you know, complete the loop then in evaluating at the end what we've done um, and, you know, hopefully tools would be able to do that for us rather than me taking a day and a half to do it. Uh, Alison, I... I... Tick uh, one of your wish list then. Uh, we have a tool that is called QueryVis um, that allow you to load uh, um, uh, your query, your Boolean query. It allow you to load uh, your assessment uh, of you know, the, the retrieved documents and then your labels, your assessment uh, included, excluded. And that builds uh, a, a tree of your Boolean query with all its logic and it maps uh, how much, uh, how many uh, relevant document uh, in the ratio relevant or relevant or included or excluded um, your, your terms have, uh, have retrieved. And then you can start playing with the nodes in the tree, which are terms and, and, uh, uh, and the Boolean logic uh, um, uh, operators uh, to see how modifying your query would have changed those, those results. So you, you can use this uh, visualization to, to play a bit around your, with your search strategy and think, you know, was there a, a, a better search strategy or, or, you know, could have cut the noise out. So does that, does that have the, all of the results or does it just have the included results that it does that with, or can you do both? Uh, you, you, load, uh, you load a file, like an end or not file uh, with your uh, labels and it will map out uh, the ratio between included and excluded. Okay, that sounds very cool. <laughs> You'll have to send me the link. I'm not sure I'll be able to use it, but please send me the link. <laughs> I wonder then with that tool, whether there is a place for it after the title and abstract screening stage to be able to then assess how well the search has worked and make adaptations to it at that point to go back. So it creates a bit of a loop around there until you get to the point where you're happy with it. I think that could be interesting to explore. Yes, definitely. So um, I was wondering that tool that you mentioned, where and how is that available as we've been talking about accessibility and um, <laughs> time. Yeah. So I guess this might be something coded in Python or can you just use it without yeah, so um, we have uh, we have uh, um, the tool. Uh, it's uh, online and, and not fantastically uh, hosted and managed. Uh, you know, it's on a university site at the moment, uh, where where anyone can use it uh, and uh, and uh, play with. We also have integrated it uh, uh, with our partners at Bond University uh, within the Systematic Review Accelerator. So it's it's one of the tools that that the uh, their to their system allows you to use, um, and uh, and our collaborators in Bond uh, like Justin Clark, he has gone around uh, um, and and show how you can use it to better understand uh, your your search and even use it for for training uh, systematic reviewers. So uh, yeah, I will make sure I will post uh, uh, a link to to the tool and then you know for, for you to play around and possibly I put it on the uh, YouTube comments of the live stream. 
Great. Thanks for that. So, um, yeah, I, I would, I think we're already um, almost out of time, but I would like to um, make one last loop to what Michael mentioned um, previously, how, you know, these AI tools actually might change the whole way we do searches. And um, I was wondering what, what you had in mind or what, all of you have in mind. I mean, have you tried to do a system, a quick systematic review with ChatGPT or any of the new tools? And what what were your findings? Or I mean, there's so many at the moment, like illicit or stuff. So um, yeah, what are your thoughts? Um, uh, yeah, Guido. <laughs> yeah, I guess I can chip in a bit uh, on these. So. Um, we we have used uh, ChatGPT. Uh, we have used ChatGPT in in a few ways. Uh, one way is to uh, attempt to create a, a boolean query for a systematic review, um, and uh, and in there we looked at engineering different prompts, different input to to ChatGPT, and even we attempted to use ChatGPT in its conversational real setting, right, where where we don't uh, just give one input and expect an output, but we build the input through several conversations. Um, and, uh, and what we have found with that work is that um, the technology is quite promising, but it's not yet there. Um, you know, we can build queries that are uh, surprisingly quite effective, but still below what, uh, what, uh, um, what uh, uh, an information specialist can build. Um, However, the problem is, you know, the current use is that you can get, uh, you know, you can get away from the uh, blank space syndrome, right? You, you can start immediately from a Boolean query that's, that is quite decent, and then new information specialists can, can get that and evolve it uh, into something good. Um, so, so that's one problem is it seems quite good uh, uh, in terms of uh, uh, precision uh, as opposed to recall. Um, so, you know, if you are attempting to do um, some rapid reviews, it seems to be um, maybe maybe one uh, tool that might be quite helpful in that respect. Um, however, we are, uh, so, so this this one, the works we have done, uh, another work we have done um, attempted to uh, extract uh, from ChatGPT, extract uh, um, um, answers to specific medical questions and uh, and get evidence for it. So, you know, can you, ChatGPT, uh, give me actual the studies, the reference to the studies? And, and that has been actually not very good. Um, you know, th there's plenty of hallucinations in these language models. And, and, uh, um, and what is, I think what is dangerous is that what it produces looks like decent. Um, and so you might believe in it. Um, some of the references it produces or links it produces actually that do exist, uh, but then the claims made about those references are, are not in, in, in these sources, okay? So, um, you know, we found ChatGPT being quite good for some specific uh, uh, type of, of tasks, but to be a bit sloppy for more complex tasks, especially around the, 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 the synthesis of knowledge, right? Uh, however, we are in the early days of, uh, of, of these uh, uh, new generative models, right? And there are improvements that are coming out every day, really. Um, and, and I think we, we, are, we are understanding these models more and more. Um, so I wouldn't be surprised that uh, that there is uh, um, you know that soon we manage to do some of these tasks much better than what we are doing at the moment. Um, in in innovation management, we have the concept of disruption, and uh, that means uh, when a new technology comes in um, that uh, typically creeps in from the low end of the market, and that in the case of AI coming to evidence synthesis at, in the form of lower quality uh, evidence synthesis. And I think there's currently the value there 
um, that it might introduce a new type of, of evidence synthesis, which is low cost, uh, very fast, um, and re will replace a lot of uh, reviews that are already uh, higher cost, but it's low quality. So I think it, it, it will replace those and put more pressure even on um, being higher of higher quality. So I think it's a good effect of, of AI that um, we, like at the moment we have about 60,000 uh, systematic reviews, meta-analysis, I'm counting a, a couple of uh, years ago. So it's a, lo a lot of reviews, a lot of meta-analysis. And uh, there's uh, some, some comments uh, that circulate that uh, the quality of most of those reviews uh, is uh, subpar. And I think uh, AI can get the low end at the moment to uh, a, a better level, um, take, needing to consider all those problems with hallucination and everything. Um, but I, I, it's, it's difficult to foresee the future. Um, and you know it better than, than me, Guido. Um, but I think uh, there will be a, a lot of new developments now triggered after, after the launch of ChatGPT. Um, and and I think we should, in evidence synthesis, embrace it as, as something that can facilitate our tasks. And but we need to, when we when we want to have the highest quality of evidence synthesis, and that should be our goal, then we need to define the the, the, the tasks that are critical um, or that, that can be um, um, supported in, in our daily work. And um, I think. I think that there's a lot of promise there. Uh, and maybe one addition, I, I, just a side note, I, I found out that uh, what, what uh, those AI tools can also do is you can prime them. Um, and I tried it out once uh, I primed them with, okay, uh, look up what Cochrane Handbook is and uh, give me some uh, advice on, on how to kick off my, my evidence synthesis. And I think that even... Um, uh, increases the value of, of good guidance because uh, that can be fueled into the how how the, the, the AI um, um, will will respond to the to the inputs we give them. So if we if we if we create good guidance for those systems, I think then uh, the quality of, of of the output we receive even um, comes better. Um, yes, definitely. So I, I to uh, remind everyone that I love this discussion, but we have to find a, um, find an end. So maybe some last remarks from all of you <laughs> would be lovely. Guido, you already started. <laughs> uh, I, I was uh, I was I wanted to say that you know it's a very exciting time at the moment in in AI and also looking at it from the evidence synthesis. Uh, lens as a viewpoint, um, but uh, um, I, I believe uh, um, we still don't have a, a very uh, profound understanding of how these methods work um, and, uh, and in making sure that people are using it in the right way. Um, uh, Michael mentioned uh, prompting. Um, you know, this input that you provide to, to the models. And, and um, we have a study that shows, you know, it, it's, it's very clear that the quality of the prompting affects uh, these models and the effectiveness of this model. And we have a study that shows how um, providing evidence in specific way to this prompt changes completely what the model suggests, right? In, in terms of, of uh, you know, ac actionable decision that then you could take from these models. Um, so, so I think uh, I think there is plenty more than we need to do before we uh, actively rely, um, and maybe blandly rely on, on AI technology. But, but certainly there's a lot of promise in there and really exciting. Uh, you know, Michael said he went to in holiday recently. I cannot take leave because uh, every day there is something new and exciting that comes out. Okay, thank you. So, Hannah, Allison, do you have any last thoughts on the future of information retrieval? So, I think I agree with everybody here today. I think there is a lot of promise for automation. I think the tools that we have available already are helping us to go some way towards this. Um, 
for anybody who is interested in tools, the Systematic Review Toolbox has a huge list of tools that are available so far. Um, and I think it's it's definitely something that is worth exploring and expanding upon now and in the future. Thank you, Hannah. Alison, yeah. Um, I don't think I have any more to add. Um, I'm quite excited to see what's going to happen. Um, but I won't be um, testing these things out at the moment, I don't think. Um, I think I might leave it to you know, the likes of Michael and Guido and maybe Hannah to, um, to do the first tranche of is it going to work and how is it going to work before I go, oh, OK, I'll try it. <laughs> um, you know, so, yeah, good luck with it all. <laughs> yeah, so, um, yeah, thank you all for joining today. And I'd really love to have this panel again in like a few years and see what's been happening because I, I'm sure there's a lot going on. And yeah, this was a great discussion, got some great insights. And um, yeah, thank you all. Thank you very much. And uh, all the questions that maybe come from the audience, uh, I'd be happy. I'll be having a look at Twitter and Slack. And um, yeah, I'd love to hear if there's any questions. So 